doing all the cool tech while we're getting this set up. We're also going to have a um, live transcription of today's event so that we can read along as we go. Jessica, while we're waiting for people to join, do you want to um, say hello to some of the people that are here? Sure. Uh, and also, just you know, in demonstrating vulnerability and best practices, can you re-enable my video so people can see my face while I'm talking to them? We just switched host permission. This is advanced Zoom, uh, Zoom strategy right here. Uh, hi, this is Jessica, and I'm Jan and I are co-CEOs of Causet, and. I, uh, my title is Chief Empowerment Officer, which means that I focus on bringing some of our big ideas and new mental models into practice with people on the ground in their daily work, working with organizations a lot. And good morning. Uh, if you'd like to go over into the chat, we can make introductions to ourselves there without having a a new term that I've learned since the beginning of all of this remote work and COVID thing, which is fear of unmuting, F-O-U-M is a new acronym I just <laughs> learned, where people uh, don't speak up in these group calls because they're worried that they'll talk over someone or uh, miss an important point. So in the interest of not having fear of unmuting, uh, please feel free to type an intro or uh, introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, but also, it looks like MJ just gave everyone permission, so you don't have to have fear of unmuting. Um, but it's always good to raise your hand in the chat so that we know that someone's about to speak. Look, there's David. Now I feel like a sports commentator. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, David, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, this is David Hill, as I as I wrote. Uh, I'm a consultant, and I am here to help support uh, Causet's webinar on online events. And I've worked with Causet uh, on different projects for a while, and I'm really looking forward to today's webinar. All right. Cool. My name is MJ Petroni. Um, I'm the principal at Causet Incorporated, which means Jessica and I are co-CEOs. And my role is the chief exponential officer. And today we're gonna to be talking a bit about how to rethink online events um, and what does it mean to go beyond dialing in. Um, for the rest of you, if you haven't already introduced yourself, go ahead and use the chat window on the right and um, let us know a little bit more about what brings you today. Um, anyone else feel like they wanna say hello verbally? Just getting a sense of who's in the room and modeling the practices of actually talking about who's participating and not just watching uh, conference TV. Well, I don't know why no one else is talking, but I'll go for it. Um, I'm a project manager at the Berkeley Lab, and I run a conference that's international that meets every year. And um, we're trying to figure out what to do about our July meeting that's supposed to be in Toronto. So I'm trying to get some ideas of how to maybe run that virtually. Great, thanks for introducing yourself. Anyone else want to say hi? All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started here and talk about the premise of how we got to this whole conversation. I'm going to share my screen so that you all can see it. And Jessica and David will help with the, um, the co-hosting part of things. And let me go ahead and make sure that David's enabled on that too so we have that extra set of hands. Um, here we go, David. All right. So um, the premise of what we're doing today is based in our work at Causet, uh, being a, a group of cyborg anthropologists and futurists. And uh, you know, in addition to being a goofy title, um, and, and I promise we didn't make it up, uh, cyborg anthropology means we study the relationship between humans and technology. So today we're going to talk about what does it mean to rethink remote. Um, and specifically the idea of rethinking remote events. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. Jessica, are we able to see all right? 
You're muted. <laughs> I am muted. Yes, we can see. Great. Cool. Awesome. So as we go along, um, we're going to have a content throughout this week called Rethinking Remote. And some of the things that we're looking at are how to, for example, bring events online, start your remote work plan, and even conceive of the impact on your, uh, your company or your organization in terms of the strategies that are playing out. So as we get started, the first thing that we need to understand is that events are platforms for connection. And when I say platforms, I mean something that enables third-party connections. So the host of the event creates something, but they don't create all of the value. The value comes from peer-to-peer -peer connections. That's why there's a difference between a large event or conference and say watching something on television. So presentations alone don't enable what we call network effects, which is the exponentially increasing value of a network as more members get added to it. So we can't just cancel events and expect to get the same kinds of results by posting presentations or links to videos. What we have to do is create not just the ability for people to see who's on stage, but also the ability for people to interact with each other in a peer-to-peer -peer way. So we're gonna talk about a number of different strategies for that today and make sure that we've explored all the possibilities out there. Good meeting outcomes can still happen even when we can't be in the same physical place, but we have to think differently. Now, what I mean by that is that you know, what your event will look like is only as good as the lowest common denominator. So if you have the best technology out there, but the people who are at your event don't understand how they could use it or why that would be useful, you'll still get something that seems like a conference call. And if you have people who are really committed to peer-to-peer -peer interaction and participating fully, but they don't have access to the technology, you'll still just get a conference call. So you need to have both the technology and the thinking about how online events can work. So what we did is put the content that we know from putting on events all around the world at all different scales and said, what are the real core intentions behind that? And how can some of those in-person strategies be translated to online events? We won't pretend that we're the ultimate experts on this. We just looked at what's going on in the world right now and how many organizations are panicked and really struggling and said, look, what can we do to move the conversation forward? To that end, if you have great ideas or great experiences that you'd like to share about what's going on in your event, or if you're willing to workshop this with us a little bit on the call, that would be great. Um, for everyone to know, we're streaming this live on YouTube, which also means that there'll be access to this after the fact. However, the chat window won't be visible on YouTube, so don't worry about that um, if you wanna put something a little bit more private, but still have the conversation happen in the group here. So if we look at advanced technologies, a lot of times we think of something cool like virtual reality and what's out there. But if you think about what virtual reality requires, which is high bandwidth connections, a strong computer or a dedicated device, and everyone thinking through how it works, much less people who can see through VR goggles, which isn't me because my glasses and my vision doesn't let me really do that. You know, there's a couple big leaps in there. And you can see that both the thinking about being in an online space and the technology have to be there for that to work. So a lot of times the bar is too high for people. So what we wanted to do is to look at things that are a lot closer to the technologies we have available now and the mental models we have available now to make these kinds of events as interesting as possible. So the first thing, the first shift that we absolutely have to pay attention to is that you have to shift your thinking from audiences to participants. Because most of the time when we plan events, we think about the parts of the events that have a presenter on stage and audiences who are listening or maybe a breakout group in a really traditional sense. But we, we don't always think about how we would take all of the things that happen around an event and make them online. For example, the networking hours, the cocktail hours, if that's your kind of event, um, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer interactions that happen in deeper workshops or co-designed workshops. Um, and sometimes live events even have things like an unconference um, where people get to bring their own ideas in the moment and create something on the fly. It's a lot harder to do that kind of thing in the, in the um, kind of online space. And you'll notice that um, as we think about what we want to do online, our thinking reverts back to that lowest common denominator of having audiences and that first mental model of having audiences. So it, what you want to do is to start to shift the thinking from audiences to participants. As we go along today, please feel free to take notes um, directly in the chat window for others as well, so they can kind of see what everyone's talking about, especially if they join late. But also know that we have an article that parallels this that covers a lot of these things in more detail. So if we think about how participation works, 
what we think about often is round tables. When we talk to event producers, they're talking about how can we have a, you know, cocktail rounds or uh, tables of six or eight, that kind of thing. And even if we have someone on stage, we often set up conferences where there's a group of people around a table who pivot to look at what's on stage, but where the default position is looking inwards towards each other. So when you do that online, you want to start to think about how do I create smaller spaces for people to interact as peers that are not overwhelming, like having 400 people in a chat room. Modern technologies allow you to create these breakout rooms, but so do um, you know, relatively basic tools like Twitter or Facebook, where people can use a thread to have a discussion. If you look at um, what MIT did, I'm going to read this because it may not be visible on all of your devices um, or if you're dialing in. MTech Digital is an artificial intelligence conference. Jessica and I went to this conference maybe two years ago. I was watching this um, and about a week ago uh, when we were writing this article, um, they announced that they were going to take their event online. And what's really interesting is you can look at the way that they talk about this and none of it mentions the technology, which is almost ironic given that it's a Massachusetts Institution of Technology kind of event. They said, our new digital first program promises to deliver both the insight and access you were expecting from our live event. We'll be featuring the same speakers covering the same topics, all curated by MIT Tech Review, all aimed to give you practical guidance and expert insight on the technical, ethical, and strategic AI deployment issues facing organizations in 2020. So for one, they reassured that the quality of the content will be the same. The next thing that they said that's important is in digital form through Q&A and chat rooms, you'll be able to you know, have your say and get answers to your questions from our experts. We're going to run an accelerated schedule, keeping the individual presentation shorter so that our online attendees can have more time to ask questions and interact with the content. So uh, the other thing that they said is that previously registered attendees, when this is a paid event, will automatically be signed up for the virtual conference. So this is important to look at here as well because they've found a way to, you know, assume good intent that people want to event, attend these events and, um, you know, have that set up a little bit in advance. So here we go next. So the first intention around this is to have shared experiences and epiphanies. Um, but before I go any further, I want to just check, does anyone have questions here that you specifically want to have answered today, actually, before I jump into that next section? If so, can you use the Q&A tool in Zoom, which is available at the bottom of your screen, or use the chat window? Um, and Jessica and I will manage that live on the fly. Um, but before I go ahead, does anyone want to you know, take a moment to ask a question or put an intention in for today? What would you like to cover in, in the session today? Also, I'm uh, making sure that those of you who weren't already enabled for speaking are enabled for speaking now in the system. Let's see, we have a number of new uh, joins, which is great. Is anyone willing to be the brave one and share what you'd like to get out of the webinar today? Uh, hello. Uh, yeah. Hi. The, uh, um, first thing, I, I, I fired a question off to you. What's been the best question you've been asked? Now, in regards to that would be, what's the best question you've been asked in uh, preparing a online versus an offline? Yeah. Um, well, I'd say one of the best questions that we get asked is, is some of what we're um, going to cover today, which is how do I allow people to interact with each other instead of interacting with people on stage? And this is really hard in a lot of the tools that are out there because the default way that we think about this is more like streaming an event that you watch and you would you know, cross your arms and sit back and watch television as opposed to having something where everyone's in a room together and can raise their hand or participate more fully or talk to their neighbor um, sitting in the audience with them. So one of the things that we suggest is that whatever tool you're using to broadcast things from on stage have some ability to manage Q&A and questions, and that you also have something going on on a social network that people already know how to use. So whether that's a private LinkedIn or Facebook group, or it's more public on Twitter or a public version of LinkedIn or Facebook pages, have a place that people already know how to use where they can ask questions and talk to each other. You can use something like a hashtag um, or a specific topic that you use the language consistently so that people know that the event that you're discussing is the same event um, as what they're watching. 
Can I ask a second question? Yeah. Okay, along with that, what if you've had the mindset of being a speaker and sort of your mindset is speak, 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 and then the audience list, what would be maybe three steps you'd have for, or advice for a speaker to shift their mindset? Uh, Jessica, do you want to take that one? You're muted right now. Yeah, um, I would say the number one is to build some question or inquiry or discussion into your presentation. So with cause it, we tend to, uh, we, we often describe it as beats, like beats in a song. So we'll map out our presentation in beats. So each beat would be a, a key point or a talking point or a headline uh, for a slide or a section of a presentation. And so if we map out our presentation in terms of beats, then we can get a tempo of, okay, if there are four beats, then we should have a break before we go into the next set of beats. And that gives you, you know, you can think of it as taking a deep breath for a choral singer. Um, but it, it uh, puts it into the structure of the presentation so that there are these breaks built into it. Let's say that's the number one. Um, the second would be to think through what you're curious about from the audience, as it were, and I put that in air quotes because we're talking about a shift to participants. Think about the things that you're curious that they might actually know beforehand. So kind of stack for yourself questions of things that you want to crowdsource that wisdom from the audience that you're genuinely curious about because that will bring that authenticity to it and it will keep you from forgetting as well because you actually really want to know what the audience thinks about those things. Um, and then the third would be to actually build in a few quick exercises. We have uh, small sort of worksheets that we will put up on screen that we actually have a slide in the presentation for that. Or sometimes we'll actually just put a slide in that's just a prompt question for the participants to discuss with each other at their tables. So in all three of those cases, really the answer is build it into your slides, build it into your presentation flow so that it becomes part of um, the structure of the entire thing and doesn't just feel like, you know, sometimes if you don't do that, it can be like these awkward pauses where you're just opening the floor for people to ask questions, but often people don't actually take that opportunity for lots of different reasons. So baking it into the presentation kind of solidifies and holds that space for the group participation. Thank you very much, Jessica. That's brilliant advice. Uh, I can see that also applying in written correspondence, uh, email, like emails and phones. Thank you very much. That's excellent, excellent advice. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks yeah. for the great questions, John. Yeah, and sorry to have some uh, visual distraction here. There's uh, some limitations to what we can do with the, the um, screen sharing. But so what I'm showing here on the screen is an example of a worksheet that we integrate into a talk. So we have these exercise sheets like Jessica was talking about where we move from content where we might be talking about push-based brands versus pull-based brands to um, something that is a particular exercise that is very simple so people could do it on their own. So those kinds of things are important to pay attention to because you want to have something that doesn't require a lot of steps in order for people to understand. Um, Jessica, just to give you a heads up, I can't actually see the chat window today for some fun technical reason. So you'll need to help me out with the Q&As that are going on there. No I'm going to move on to the next section, but there may be some Q&As that are still related to this topic and we'll come back to them um, if we have time later on. Hey, so, MJ, before you yes. get started, would you like me to read to you what's in the Q&A stack? Sure. Okay. Uh, this is, we're just role modeling so good today. Uh, so Anna said that she is especially interested in quick and dirty approaches that can be re implemented rapidly. So, yep. um, you know, things that don't require a big install, et cetera. Uh, incidental peer-to-peer -peer connections without new technology and restrictive security environments um, from yep. our friend Nicola from TD, as we have a lot of experience with that as well. We have worked frequently with banks and know a lot about those challenges of the internal IT systems. Um, and uh, things that are actually better online or virtual than they are in person. 
and yep. thought diversity. So I think all most of those things are covered, but just to highlight them as they come up, I think we can Great. get most of those answered today. Thanks, guys. Sounds good. Yeah, so we're going to cover a number of um, intentions here. Uh, one of the intentions for any good event is having shared experiences and epiphanies. Now, when I say epiphany, I mean an aha moment, like a shift in thinking. I don't just mean knowledge acquisition. And when I talk about shared experiences, you know, yeah, people have some commonality around TV shows they watch, but they, they you know, probably have lasting memories that go further about things they actually did with other people. So what we want to look at is how can we have shared experiences that bond groups together as well as epiphanies that people have at a similar time. And I don't mean specifically a time in the agenda, although you can plan for that too. But if you think of a large company hosting an event, one of the things that they often want to do is cause a shift in thinking in the company to happen all at the same time. Like when they're um, rolling out a new purpose for the company or a new strategy, or there's a, you know, a merger or acquisition of another company. In an organization, it might be a shift in um, their focus or their fundraising strategy. So there, there's lots of different ways and reasons why people might want to do this. So you know, this is a photo from our Singularity University Canada partners from an event that they did um, where they had a lot of people gathered around a literal fire. And you think around you know, the gathering around the fire and talking together and all these chats and everything, that's an example of where people are having some kind of shared experience that isn't specifically about knowledge acquisition, it's about having a sense of community arise for them. It's very hard to gather around the fire online as it were. So a lot of times what we look for is to use tools that are as simple as possible, exactly to the point of the, uh, some of the commenters or, or question posers as um, were on there. So you know, if your company has a tool like Slack or Yammer or HipChat or Rocket Chat or any of these kind of enterprise style chat tools, that's a great place for people to start to have some shared experiences when they're commenting on content as you go along. In fact, if you're organizing a live event you can designate someone to be capturing uh, pictures of the screen and putting it into the chat window. So there's a place for people to comment on those beats that Jessica was talking about, each beat of the conversation. So a lot of times if we're look, working with an online event organizer, we'll make sure that they have a few key assets um, in the form of slides or questions to be posed to the audience or simple worksheet prompts that can be pasted into a live chat a Twitter feed, a Facebook or LinkedIn feed, so that we're not asking people to have a whole new, um, you know, technology overhead. They can use the tools that they already know. When you also, um, you know, add some extra layers to this, there are some tools you can do where you show people some of the shared epiphanies that are happening throughout the event. Because sometimes you get that kind of Charlie Brown style thing where it's like, nah, 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 and people zone out and they miss the beats of the conversation or they have to step out because their kid's not feeling well or someone you know, brought a delivery to the door or whatever else it is that's going on in, their, in uh, you know, their physical world environment. So one of the things you can do is use a novel tool that doesn't require your users to do anything other than click on a URL. This is a tool that we use called um, Miro, M-I-R-O, which means to see in Spanish and um, a lot of other things that, you know, it kind of connotes. But the idea of Miro is to have an infinitely zoomable whiteboard and to use tools like a pen or post-it notes to be able to put key ideas up. And we do use this all the time. In fact, this particular event, um, I was actually doing this live on stage as I was doing, uh, hosting a panel. So I was, it was a little clunky, but it was an experiment in seeing how quickly we could get these things up. You can have multiple people work on the same board as well. So even if your whole uh, attendee base or participant base does not have access to these tools, you, even if you have two or three key people at the event who are doing kind of live visual note taking, you can show people the arc of what's going on. But perhaps more importantly in this whole process is make sure that there is a clear narrative arc for your event. A good organizational uh, practice in general with events is to have a clear intention for the, the number of epiphanies or the sequence of epiphanies or aha moments that people will have, but it's particularly important for online events. The way that you describe sessions, the visuals that you use, et cetera, are really important to keep the room focused, as it were, when you don't have someone who can watch how everyone is reacting in quite the same way and kind of guide particular people back into the room or on topic, as it were. 
The next intention is focusing on functional outcomes. So sometimes an organization has specific, organi uh, specific um, strategic outcomes that they need to focus on. And what I mean by this is they might need everyone to understand the new customer base that will be coming into the organization based on a merger, or they might need people to come up with a annual plan or grassroots fundraising um, plan or whatever. There may be something tactical that has to emerge from the group. And this is where using tools like Google Docs or other kind of collaborative spaces can be important. Um, but you can also do the same kind of thing with the visual boards that we're talking about around showing what of uh, the key outcomes need to be addressed in what order and how they're connected with each other. Now, this was something that was done at an event that we did with Singularity University um, in the United States around their innovation partners program. And it was a two day long event with speakers from all kinds of different backgrounds who did not have standardized slides or anything else like that. So our job was to help people understand what functional outcomes needed to occur. So Jessica and I hosted some workshops that were about integrating what had happened on stage into action plans that people could take back to their organization. And we used a tool like this to synchronize the room of 150 or so people to see how each group was having different aha moments. So it doesn't have to be really fancy, but having any kind of artifact that you build upon as you go throughout the event will make a big difference in people understanding and engaging. The other thing is setting up time in advance for breakout groups. So if you have working groups who are in a normal workshop, you would have them gather around a table or something like that, have times in the agenda, whether you're using a tool like Zoom that allows you to do breakout rooms or you're just telling people to hop on their own conference calls between 1 and 2 p.m. or whatever else, where smaller groups can work together in a more organic way that isn't so on stage like. So I'm going to pause before I go much further just to see um, where everyone's at and if there are any more questions that have popped up that are related to this. Jessica, is there anything that I haven't been able to see that's off screen? There's nothing new, um, but I am wondering if, because I think some of what you've just gone through uh, is very relevant to these questions about how can the virtual event actually have more value or have a different kind of value than what the in-person one might have. Um, mm -hmm. And and also about the thought diversity piece, um, I think is a good highlight here that like, especially when you have different kinds of uh, neurodiversity in the room and different personality types, that having this multimedia approach actually can invite participation or actually make it more accessible for more different kinds of people for whom just having someone talking at the front of the room might actually not be the best way for them to engage. Cool. Yeah, so uh, one of the things... Oh, but John just posted in, he's wondering what's the best insight that we've gotten from using Miro? which is actually a great question because we've used this platform so much. Yeah, so with Miro, um, the main thing to, to focus on is to provide some path and frames for people. So what I'm gonna do is I'll switch screens here over to an actual Miro board so you can see what's going on because I thought there might be a question. I promise we didn't, we didn't rig this with John. He's just being a particularly engaged audience member who is now a participant. Um, so this is something that we created called a future map. And you won't see the text right now because it's zoomed out. Um, and what, what we did was try and create a map that was non-linear that helped people understand the future of automobility. So driverless cars and new transportation systems, cities and smarter cities, platform economies, a whole bunch of different things that were connected to each other. So um, what you can see here is there's these squares around particular things, and that's what is called a frame in Miro. And you can think about this as like the boards that you might post up around the room for different visual note taking sessions. So if you were to have 10 different sessions and you had 10 different visual note taking kind of um, papers show up because people, you know, you'd have someone in the room scribing as someone was talking, um, you might end up with 10 of them. So how do those things get connected? So Miro calls this frames. And the first one that we recommend people do is actually just explain how the tool works. So in this case, we said future maps can be used to identify mindset changes which need to occur, show a company's innovation journey, bridge different thinking styles, that sort of thing, and help people understand how it works. So I'm not going into a ton of detail here because this is a specific kind of board that we created. But what's cool to notice is 
you can zoom in on any particular topic, in this case, the social network of things, which is like the internet of things, but gone to the next level. Now, I have some objects here where I've drawn connected lines, um, and I can move these lines, I can label the lines, um, you know, all kinds of different things. Let's see if it'll let me do it. No, nope, now that we're watching it, it doesn't want me to. Um, and then I have different board, uh, sorry, post-it notes that I can move around or sticky notes if we're being generic. But the really cool thing is you can paste in any link and it will automatically open it up just the same way as if you put a link into a post on Facebook. And then that link is clickable. So I can now click on this and go over to a third party source. This is a great way to give some depth and context to the claims that you're making in a presentation. Or like Jessica just said, the term neurodiversity. And this talk today isn't on the topic of neurodiversity, but not everyone in the call may be familiar with that. So she could put a link to what is neurodiversity. And if someone literally wanted to zoom in on that, they could. And you can also comment on it, which is really cool. So I could put a comment like, oh, go check this out. And it would show that I put that comment and other people could reply to it. So this is an example of where you can have these kind of live, asynchronous, um, spontaneous connections. And I just said a term here that is pretty important around all of this which is asynchronous. Have you created a way for people to plug in, not in a really strict linear sense, like you might be forced to do at a live event, but on their own pace and at their own time? So one of the things that is important is in the live event, you often have times for people to take breaks and think about things and integrate, but you don't necessarily have the space for people to do that um, online. And so you wanna create some parallels to that. I see Jessica smiling, which probably means there's a good conversation going on over on chat. Yeah, people are very excited about Miro and they're asking about it and David was answering them, but his Zoom uh, chat status was set to only reply to panelists. So oh, well, they were hearing him. It was a perfect example of what happens. <laughs> but also, and also I'm very excited that people are getting um, lit up about Miro. We, we love this software. Um, and we just continue to find new ways to use it. I would say that yeah. for me, um, my biggest insight in Moreau is, uh, or biggest thing of, as far as value goes, is that it allows multiple people to visually do their work on the same canvas without having to think the same way about it. So for example, yeah. you know, if you have one person with the pen on the whiteboard, the way that person visualizes things is going to be the way that everyone gets to see them. And in Miro, for example, if me and MJ are using it to do our business strategy, we can have parallel canvases side by side and be doing mind maps in our totally different ways of thinking through things, and then be able to flip over and interact with each other's and then find the connectivity between the two of them. Um, and so if you think about that in terms of like large group events, being able to have, for example, five or six breakout groups, each of whom have their own mini canvas within the same workspace is an incredible opportunity to be able to see each other's work and interact with it without it being complete chaos. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, the other thing about this is that you can have simultaneous different things like Jessica was talking about um, and you could assign one person to create a map that's based on um, networks of people who are discussed. So like, oh, we're talking about these customers and those customers and these partners and another person who is focusing on action items. And they could have separate boards, like she said, or you, you could have the work in the same space. You can also do some really cool stuff. And then I'm going to stop raving about this, but we really do like this tool where you can take a, um, a sticky note like this and add a tag like, um, doctrine or, uh, sorry, concept. I might add this tag called concept and add another one over here called concept. And then if I were to search, which is up in the top right here for concepts, I can see all of the concepts and go from place to place. So this is a great place to say, for example, tag action items export anything that's tagged as a list into a spreadsheet so that you immediately have action items. That's not something that's very easy to do and especially not easy to do collectively in a live event unless you've coordinated in advance. 
but doing it in this way allows everyone to, to work on this. And you can have people be able to vote up or vote down particular ideas and a lot of other cool engagement tools. So I'm gonna go back over to um, our keynote here. And when I say uh, keynote, I mean software, not me talking on stage all day. Um, actually, um, MJ, can I make one quick comment? Yeah. So um, for everybody who is, is looking at this tool and evaluating and thinking about online events, um, one of the things that I, I, you know, the question that I have when I first saw Miro and, and, and started uh, working with it is, how is it different than an infographic? And, uh, you know, because you're creating an artifact, right? And so there, there might be a question of like, well, if everybody's going to produce this and then the attendees or, or participants were there, a lot of them, won't they just like tune out and then at the end of it, just go through and read it on their own. And the truth is, is that the value really comes in building it together, right? So not only is it an artifact that you're producing, um, but it, it really roots in people's memories and they deepen their understanding when they are engaging and interacting and processing it in real time. So there's huge amounts of value that comes out of using a collaborative tool like this in, in deepening the understanding versus just having an artifact at the, at the end that for people who didn't participate. So I, I really see that the, this is an incredible tool to use for both, right? Not only do you get this thing that you can walk away with that has all this information and, and different people's points of view, but the journey you, you actually, especially for an online event where you're trying to get participation and engagement, um, it really does you know, cognitively engage everybody because, because there's lots of information and lots of connections and lots of opportunities to contribute. Yeah, I think, you know, the other thing to talk about, uh, and then we'll, we'll go back on to some of these other topics in the event, is that we talked about shared experiences and building your own board as a small group can be a shared experience. And you could have eight boards set up in advance. And when you go into a breakout group kind of session, everyone goes to work on their particular boards based on their department or breakout group of some sort. And what that does is it gives people an, like, you know, this experience of co-creating rather than consuming content, which means they have a sense of ownership and a desire to share it with others. All right, so um, one of the other intentions for these kinds of events is having new connections, spontaneous serendipitous connections with other people. And that also can be about connections with other ideas. So one of the ways to think about this is around a diversity of thinking, as Jessica was mentioning earlier. And we have a quiz that we often offer for people called Thinking Styles. Um, and I will go ahead and put a link into it here. So as soon as I get my cursor back to everyone, there we go. And thinking styles um, are, you know, these examples of the ways that people contribute value and think through particular challenges or ideas. So this is not the same as, say, for example, a role that someone has at a company um, or a job title or something like that. Let me give you an example of these eight thinking styles and um, a kind of rapid crash course in this. So. Thinking styles are approaches to solving problems and pursuing opportunities. So um, a great example of this is, you know, thinking outside of the context of roles or personality or skills or motivation, but it said this, this piece around where do we go to solve problems? So this was developed um, by Mark Bonchek and Elisa Steele. Um, and it were, you know, in close uh, collaboration with a lot of these folks. Um, on the left side, what we're looking at is the orientation. Is someone a detailed thinker or a big picture thinker? And, or are they exercising detailed thinking or big picture thinking? On the bottom axis is focus. Are people contributing value through ideas, process, action, or relationships? So explorers might be looking at big picture ideas and they might be you know, the futurists of the world or um, you know, kind of the innovative types who are coming up with what's next and can see way far out. Experts are more focused on the detailed elements of ideas. So experts might be scientists or researchers who are looking for some kind of truth in the data. Planners look at big picture process. So how do we achieve something over time? Um, and with a complex system, designing complex systems is their favorite thing to do. Optimizers 
are looking at the, the details again. So they're tweaking things. If you think of you know, obvious titles like a search engine optimization process, that process is something that is about achieving the best possible efficiency. Energizer thinking is about big picture action. So this is the kind of um, you know, rah, rah, get everyone motivated, ready to go on stage person um, versus the action focus, which is, I'm sorry, the uh, detailed version of that focus, which is producers, which might be the people who are taking a ton of notes or um, you know, creating a ton of copy or writing a lot. So these are prolific uh, production kind of folks who are, are looking at how do you achieve momentum by rapidly completing things. So all of these different kinds of thinking, I won't get into all the details here, but all these different kinds of thinking are necessary. And we all can use all of these thinking styles, but we may be stronger in some than others. One of the things that we found is that large events typically are focused on the big picture um, because of limits of space and time. And they also tend to really bias towards explorers and energizers who are trying to motivate people or show a really large context which is why a lot of folks will say, hey, I was really looking for something with more detail from that event, or I wanted to go further into action around it. And that can be very hard to do with the dynamic of audiences. But using some of these tools like Miro or breakout groups and things like that, you can leverage more kinds of thinking, which is more akin to say a symposium where people go into more detailed research sessions and discussions. So these diverse thinking styles are important to leverage. And the simple question to ask yourself um, after you perhaps read a little bit more about this, I put the link over in um, the chat window. After you read more about this is, are there space or is there space for each of these thinking styles in our event? Do we have room for many people to leverage different kinds of thinking and contribute different kinds of thinking? And this is where a tool like Miro or Google Docs can be helpful because you can allow people to zoom in on a particular topic and go as detailed as they want and others can stay big picture and you can have people leverage all of those different kinds of thinking at the same time. All right, so uh, I'm gonna move back over to our uh, rethinking remote session here. All right, uh, any questions about that so far? So we're about two thirds of the way through the topics we're talking about, new connections, functional outcomes, shared experiences and epiphanies. Any other questions so far that we wanna cover? Jessica, you've been monitoring the uh, rich Q&A and chat that's going on. Yes, I think the biggest thing that's going on in the chat is that people are very interested in having a follow-up space um, after this webinar to, you know, share insights and, and how it's going with them, trying to implement some of this stuff and coming up with new hacks for how to keep going in this new climate. Um, so that's exciting. And we will figure that out after the call. And uh, as I said in the chat, everyone, um, I believe signed up with an email address. So that's the one that we will contact you at to let you know where to go and, and follow up with each other. And maybe even multiple spots, you know, as we were saying in our best practices, um, and I was typing this as a response in one of the Q and A's, but then realized I'm not sure that it posts to everybody. But one of my pro tips um, for getting things ramped up quickly is to have it happen in multiple places. So, you know, for some people, just like on a, a webinar like this, right, some people have to dial in with their phones because they don't have video capability on their computer. And some people are going to watch the recording later. So having multiple places, multiple apps, multiple platforms that things are occurring in really um, helps to be a contingency plan for lots of different use cases. So I'd say the same thing with the follow-up, right? Like maybe we'll set up a WhatsApp group as well as a Miro board, as well as there could be just a Google doc that people are sharing information and in, you know, that's perhaps the most accessible of all of those things. All you need is a browser and a free Gmail address. So just really thinking through the full spectrum from people who are well outfitted and very tech savvy to people who may need to be using a public computer um, and only interacting in, in text documents. So that kind of breadth can be really helpful for making sure things are effective. And we'll model that after this with that. Thank you for giving us a use case. Yeah, great. So the other thing that we wanna let people do here is we were talking about these new connections. Um, I mentioned earlier this idea of using online tools like um, you know Slack or Twitter or LinkedIn Making sure that people know who's attending the event is important and giving them an optional space to participate in peer-to-peer -peer connections is important. Um, so 
again, start with what people already know. So is everyone who's attending your event, pretty much all of them already on LinkedIn or already on WhatsApp? Why not use a tool you already have rather than trying to create a new one? So as you want to cultivate deeper relationships around your event, you might consider some of these novel technologies that we ourselves are just gonna start experimenting with here in the next few weeks. Um, one of them is called Verbella. And Verbella is an online tool that allows for virtual reality interactions um, and kind of online conferences. And the idea is more like a video game. So you can see it might take a lot more of a learning curve, but you might start with something, um, you know, that has to do with um, this kind of online uh, tool like Miro. And then you may have others that are more in depth that uh, where there's some more learning uh, time available for people to learn how to use something like Verbella. So Singularity University has done some of these events online where there are multiple people who attend a conference and you can sit in your desk and you can see different screens that are going on and you can see speakers that are participating in different ways. And this kind of online event allows people to have a bit more of the conference experience of spontaneous peer-to-peer -peer connections but you also can see who's in, uh, who's on campus, as it were, if you think of it as a university, or who's in a conference hall, who's in a meeting room, um, and it's kind of like the best of both worlds in theory. But again, there's more of a learning curve with this, and the mental models of understanding how to move around online are important. Second Life is another place that people do events. Now, I this is not the ideal picture here because these, these avatars or uh, digital representations of people have some unrealistic bodies in some ways. But the idea is that you can have these online spaces where people interact more spontaneously, um, where they can chat with each other, they can discover other users. And you know, just like at a conference, you might walk over and say, hey, can I join your conversation? Um, you can do that online. So this is where you can replicate some of the experiences that might have been in person only now in a digital space. One of the other intentions that we wanna focus on is helping people learn about a group. So learning about a group of people, this discovery about what's going on in a larger group session um, can use the thinking style I talked about. You can provide a feedback loop to people. So at an SU Canada event that we were at, Singularity University Canada, we had you know, a lot of different people in the room complete this quiz on thinking styles on our website. And then we made sure everyone could see what the balance of predominant thinking styles was in the room. Well, of course, at an event that's really focused on futurism, there were some obvious things like, yeah, there's a lot of big picture explorers. But there was quite a few people who were also focused on the detailed expert style of thinking um, that was more about solving problems with um, specificity and absolute truths and data, and not so much just the big picture piece. So by showing people a quick feedback loop from quizzes or polls that you do, you can help them learn about the group as a whole. And also tools that allow discovery like Miro, where you can see where lots of different people have been putting their own kinds of comments or conversations in can actually be even better than an in-person event because it's easier to see simultaneous conversations and search amongst them. Just like I did by searching for concepts on that board, you can search for all kinds of different thinking that are going on. Now, one thing that's really important to pay attention to is that you can't cut 85% of your staff or 90% of your staff for an event and expect to have the same degree of engagement with community. Now, I say this because it you would seem obvious, but it's really important. If you have in a live event, you know, 15 people from your organization and 100 people who are normally kind of attendees or participants of some sort, those 15 people from your organization are listening into conversations and matchmaking and learning from what's going on and reporting back after breakout sessions. But online, a lot of times people think they're going to do it with just one or two people and they don't think through all of the work that's necessary to have people talk to each other. So just like Jessica and I are co-hosting this and David's helping out and others are helping out, um, you know, you, you don't necessarily... Uh, assume that just one person can run one of these events unless you have a very mature audience who is already used to being more than an audience. In other words, if you have people like in the open source software community who are used to communicating across distance, uh, online, asynchronously all the time, you may still need to moderate things a bit, but they're going to be better at finding each other. So the, it depends on the technical maturity or the thinking 
um, that is in your audience or your group, as well as these functional pieces like bandwidth and connectivity. Anything else we want to talk about with this, Jessica, um, on the topic of helping people learn about the group as a whole? Uh, I would also just say giving, you know, if we're talking about these things like um, having a text thread that's associated or um, how to do the follow-ups, um, the WhatsApp group that came out of that um, executive event in Toronto is a great example of that. Having some kind of structure or prompt for that can be really helpful. So really my suggestion is whatever icebreakers or sort of collaboration exercises you've used in your physical world events, just try to be creative about how could you translate the, the kernel of that, the seed of that into a virtual thing. So for example, in our work, in our organization, um, we do internal check-ins via Slack. So we have some format for it. It might be a prompt question. It may be, you know, tell us uh, the coolest thing that happened over the weekend as a way to get back into connection on Monday together, even though we're not co-located, our entire team works remotely and we're spread out across the country. So think about how those things could apply to an event. Um, you know, just like MJ saying with this online quiz, there could be a version of this where people actually just type in there, you know, what they're the most excited about from the conference and then having that be available or visible to everyone in the group, um, especially if there's an opportunity for people to respond and comment. MJ's uh, modeling that right now in the chat. Any questions from people um, in the session today who would like to chime in or share something that they've seen that's worked well or ask questions about this? Let me make sure that everyone has so-called ability to speak here. All right. John's got a thinking styles question in the Q&A. How do you connect big thinkers with detailed people? Great. Yeah, so big picture thinkers and detailed folks, um, you know, one way is to coach your presenters to be perfectly uh, good at, at touching on all these topics. Another way um, they see at events all the time is um, like panelists. So this was a robotics and AI discussion. I showed the screenshot of this earlier, um, but here's me, you know, trying to host this conversation and also have the iPad going where I'm taking notes on the slide. And we had two very detailed scientists over here. Um, so this was a, a really, you know, kind of key uh, example of where I was trying to use big picture thinking to show the, the larger picture of what was going on and help people who are big picture thinkers understand the, the contextual relationship of all of these ideas that these scientists were sharing because they were data scientists and roboticists and things like that. Um, so that's one way is giving people the ability to zoom in or out. Um, another is having different session types based on different kinds of thinking you wish to emphasize. So if you have, um, you know, kind of splashy, motivational, um, highly visual things that are for the explorers who are trying to get the context, and then you had kind of a more comprehensive and methodical approach to doing the expert thinking where you're showing people step by step how something happens, that might be more process focused. So you can ask the question of, how many kinds of thinking can be reflected or acknowledged in each talk and or can certain talks emphasize one kind of thinking over another? Particularly powerful is if you can actually flag which kinds of events will have which kinds of thinking. Um, so one of the things um, that we're looking at here with this is the question I see in the chat is how thinking styles are different from or similar to StrengthsFinder and other models. Um, so uh, our colleague Mark, when he kind of um, started down this thinking styles journey and we picked up where he left off and have continued to build upon it, um, thinking styles are distinct from StrengthsFinder and a lot of these other tools that tend to focus a little bit more on innate um, capabilities or skills. What we wanted to show was what does complete thinking look like and give people something that is so quick that they can quickly identify where they relate to it um, rather than trying to get some absolute truth and profile someone. Also, the temptation when people do something like strikes finder or other assessments is to find some kind of absolute or fixed truth about a person. 
and have a profile of them that you kind of use to put them in a box. Thinking style says everyone on this call can use all eight of these thinking styles. We just might have a particular genius zone in, in some more than others. So the idea is not to put people in boxes, but actually to generate conversation. So if you look at the way that people use this at events, um, we don't have people at events usually suggest what their strengths finder style is or their Myers-Briggs or something like that, but they will instantly resonate with these very simple, understandable terms like Explorer or that sort of thing. Um, I see some great questions from Gene um, and John as well. So John, just real quick answer. There's eight kinds of thinking that we've identified that we all leverage. So um, you can see that more on the website. And then Gene saying, while we're likely to have strengths in one or two of these thinking styles, do people use the variety of these ways to address and solve issues? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So we'll come back to this and perhaps do another session on this at another time. Um, but it's a great set of questions and we really encourage you to check out our guidebook to thinking styles at causeit.org slash thinking styles. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on other topics? Great, well, we're almost at time. So I'm gonna go through these, uh, this last piece here, which is about engagement, um, which actually has been really the theme of what we're talking about the entire time. So with engagement, um, what you really wanna focus on in these discussions um, are again, how can you get people to have this idea or experience of co-creation and participation? And I probably should have put this one at the very beginning instead of the very end, but the idea of shifting from audience to participants is all about engagement. And in the article that we wrote, when we talked about engagement, we were talking about um, a little bit uh, more the splash or inspiration part of what's going on here and not so much the participation part because we're referencing that elsewhere, but it's really all part of the same thing. Um, one of the things that we find that people hate about online events is just watching talking heads or static slides. So this is where we really wanna give people the ability to co-create and use some of these tools live on their own. Some have a higher learning curve than others, um, but this is where you can really use video and other technologies to get people to have, uh, you know, these shared experiences that might otherwise be to do with lighting and room design and that sort of thing. Um, there's a lot of great folks out there who are really working on these online event kind of formats and how to do this and recommend you check out what they're doing and plug into it. Um, but we could have a whole other conversation about how to really inspire and move people in online spaces. But for now, I would say focus on what the difference is when you look at or experience something like this, um, you know, this Miro board that we're talking about, and not so much on, um, you know, trying to have the perfect virtual reality experience. The big difference when you look at something like Miro versus a static slide is that you have the ability to choose your own journey with it. And that's a really key thing um, to get people to plug into is that they can choose their own journey just like they might choose tracks or sessions in a conference or choose when to step out and talk to a peer as opposed to staying in the session. So that's the key thing we wanna really get across with engagement is provide people these kind of multimedia elements that allow them to plug in. Um, one of the things that you might also look at is can you do this in a way that doesn't require streaming um, because streaming video across a video conferencing system can be really choppy and funky but if you have like a splashy video that you want people to watch before you start, you can use something like YouTube and point them to it. But even better, again, like you're using a tool like Miro or Google Docs or something else, is it allows the, the tool to optimize for that person's bandwidth um, and give them a better experience than if you were streaming a video of you interacting with that tool. So where possible, try and do that. And one final thing on engagement that we really recommend is try using tools like otter.ai or other transcription tools that capture the verbal conversation in a visual way so that people can highlight as they go and you know, get into this. So let's say you're not ready to do Miro. One of the things you can do is have automatic transcription of your call and then be able to paste in photos or screenshots as you go. It still gives people the ability to scan through the discussion and highlight what's going on. Um, you know, for themselves and have their own kind of commentary. So this is a great way to bridge the gap without requiring as much of a technology um, play and only one or two people need to know how to use this tool in order for it to be valuable to groups of hundreds or thousands. You can even have it live transcribe as you're going along. I have that going on uh, a different computer here and um, decided not to try and have too many elements in today's call, but 
uh, definitely will let you know what the transcription looks like and have the ability to do this. So as a final piece, the raising the bar for online events really means shifting from audience to participants. Start with your thinking first and then get into the technology stuff and everything else so that you don't get bogged down in a tool without making sure that people are thinking of themselves as participants. The online transcription tool, I see a question from Jean, is called otter, like a sea otter, dot AI, like artificial intelligence. All right, so with that, be proud of how hard all of you are working on these online events and, and making the transition. Be patient with yourselves and your participants because it's gonna be hard to make these learning curves um, happen gracefully. It'll be in fits and starts. And with that, we'd love to hear more from you. You can go to posit.org slash rethinking remote um, and use the chat window that shows up on the right side of any of our websites to ask us questions at any time. You can ask us questions out of left field. It's totally fine. Just let us know who you are and that you saw this at the webinar so that we know that you have the right kind of context. Um, and yeah, go from there. Thank you so much. Please invite others to these events if you'd like. We're going to probably repeat most of these webinars so that as many people as possible have the ability to upgrade their thinking in order to be ready for this yeah. new digital age, maybe a little faster than they originally planned. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a great one.